1 John Chapter 1 From the very first day we were there, taking it all in. We heard it with our own ears, saw it with our own eyes, verified it with our own hands. The word of life appeared right before our eyes. We saw it happen. And now we're telling you in most sober prose that what we witnessed was, incredibly, this. The infinite life of God himself took shape before us. We saw it, we heard it, and now we're telling you so you can experience it along with us. This experience of communion with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Our motive for writing is simply this. We want you to enjoy this too. Your joy will double our joy. Walk in the light. This, in essence, is the message we heard from Christ and are passing on to you. God is light, pure light. There's not a trace of darkness in Him. If we claim that we experience a shared life with Him and continue to stumble around in the dark, we're obviously lying through our teeth. We're not living what we claim. But if we walk in the light, God Himself being the light, we also experience a shared life with one another. As the sacrificed blood of Jesus, God's Son, purges all our sin. If we claim that we're free from sin, we're only fooling ourselves. A claim like that is errant nonsense. On the other hand, if we admit our sins, make a clean breast of them, He won't let us down. He'll be true to Himself. He'll forgive our sins and purge us of all wrongdoing. If we claim that we've never sinned, we out and out contradict God, make a liar out of Him. A claim like that only shows off our ignorance of God. Chapter 2 I write this, dear children, to guide you out of sin. But if anyone does sin, we have a priest friend in the presence of the Father. Jesus Christ, righteous Jesus. When he served as a sacrifice for our sins, he solved the sin problem for good. Not only ours, but the whole world's. The only way to know we're in him. Here's how we can be sure that we know God in the right way. Keep his commandments. If someone claims, I know him well, but doesn't keep his commandments, he's obviously a liar. His life doesn't match his words. But the one who keeps God's word is the person in whom we see God's mature love. This is the only way to be sure we're in God. Anyone who claims to be intimate with God ought to live the same kind of life Jesus lived. My dear friends, I'm not writing anything new here. This is the oldest commandment in the book, and you've known it from day one. It's always been implicit in the message you've heard. On the other hand, perhaps it is new, freshly minted as it is in both Christ and you, the darkness on its way out and the true light already blazing. Anyone who claims to live in God's light and hates a brother or sister is still in the dark. It's the person who loves brother and sister who dwells in God's light and doesn't block the light from others. But whoever hates is still in the dark, stumbles around in the dark, doesn't know which end is up, blinded by the darkness. Loving the world. I remind you, dear children, your sins are forgiven in Jesus' name. You veterans were on the ground floor and know the one who started all this. You newcomers have won a big victory over the evil one. And a second reminder, dear children, you know the Father from personal experience. You veterans know the one who started it all. And you newcomers, such vitality and strength. God's word is so steady in you. Your fellowship with God enables you to gain a victory over the evil one. Don't love the world's ways. Don't love the world's goods. Love of the world squeezes out love for the Father. Practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from Him. The world and all its wanting, wanting, wanting is on the way out. But whoever does what God wants is set for eternity. Antichrist, it's everywhere you look. Children, time is just about up. You heard that Antichrist is coming. Well, they're all over the place. Antichrist's everywhere you look. That's how we know that we're close to the end. They left us, but they were never really with us. If they had been, they would have stuck it out with us, loyal to the end. In leaving, they showed their true colors, showed they never did belong. But you belong. The Holy One anointed you, and you all know it. I haven't been writing this to tell you something you don't know, but to confirm the truth you do know, and to remind you that the truth doesn't breed lies. So who is lying here? It's the person who denies that Jesus is the divine Christ, that's who. This is what makes an antichrist. Denying the Father, denying the Son. No one who denies the Son has any part with the Father, but affirming the Son is an embrace of the Father as well. 
Stay with what you heard from the beginning, the original message. Let it sink into your life. If what you heard from the beginning lives deeply in you, you will live deeply in both Son and Father. This is exactly what Christ promised, eternal life, real life. I've written to warn you about those who are trying to deceive you, but they're no match for what is embedded deeply within you, Christ's anointing no less. You don't need any of their so-called teaching. Christ's anointing teaches you the truth on everything you need to know about yourself and Him, uncontaminated by a single lie. Live deeply in what you were taught. Live deeply in Christ. And now, children, stay with Christ. Live deeply in Christ. Then we'll be ready for Him when He appears, ready to receive Him with open arms, with no cause for red-faced guilt or lame excuses when He arrives. Once you're convinced that He is right and righteous, you'll recognize that all who practice righteousness are God's true children. Chapter 3 What marvelous love the Father has extended to us. Just look at it. We're called children of God. That's who we really are. But that's also why the world doesn't recognize us or take us seriously, because it has no idea who He is or what He's up to. Friends, that's exactly who we are. Children of God. And that's only the beginning. Who knows how we'll end up? What we know is that when Christ is openly revealed, we'll see Him, and in seeing Him, become like Him. All of us who look forward to His coming stay ready, with the glistening purity of Jesus' life as a model for our own. All who indulge in a sinful life are dangerously lawless, for sin is a major disruption of God's order. Surely you know that Christ showed up in order to get rid of sin. There is no sin in Him, and sin is not part of His program. No one who lives deeply in Christ makes a practice of sin, None of those who do practice sin have taken a good look at Christ. They've got him all backwards. So, my dear children, don't let anyone divert you from the truth. It's the person who acts right, who is right, just as we see it lived out in our righteous Messiah. Those who make a practice of sin are straight from the devil, the pioneer in the practice of sin. The Son of God entered the scene to abolish the devil's ways. People conceived and brought into life by God don't make a practice of sin. How could they? God's seed is deep within them, making them who they are. It's not in the nature of the God-begotten to practice and parade sin. Here's how you tell the difference between God's children and the devil's children. The one who won't practice righteous ways isn't from God, nor is the one who won't love brother or sister. A simple test. For this is the original message we heard. We should love each other. We must not be like Cain, who joined the evil one and then killed his brother. And why did he kill him? Because he was deep in the practice of evil, all the acts of his brother were righteous. So don't be surprised, friends, when the world hates you. This has been going on a long time. The way we know we've been transferred from death to life is that we love our brothers and sisters. Anyone who doesn't love is as good as dead. Anyone who hates a brother or a sister is a murderer, and you know very well that eternal life and murder don't go together. This is how we've come to understand and experience love. Christ sacrificed his life for us. This is why we ought to live sacrificially for our fellow brothers and not just be out for ourselves. If you see some brother or sister in need and have the means to do something about it, but turn a cold shoulder and do nothing, what happens to God's love? It disappears, and you made it disappear. When we practice real love. My dear children, let's not just talk about love. Let's practice real love. This is the only way we'll know we're living truly, living in God's reality. It's also the way to shut down debilitating self-criticism, even when there is something to it. For God is greater than our worried hearts and knows more about us than we do ourselves. And friends, once that's taken care of and we're no longer accusing or condemning ourselves, we're bold and free before God. We're able to stretch our hands out and receive what we ask for because we're doing what He said, doing what pleases Him. Again, this is God's command, to believe in his personally named Son, Jesus Christ. He told us to love each other in line with the original command. As we keep his commands, we live deeply and surely in him, and he lives in us. And this is how we experience his deep and abiding presence in us, by the Spirit he gave us. Don't believe everything you hear. Chapter 4 my dear friends, don't believe everything you hear. Carefully weigh and examine what people tell you. Not everyone who talks about God comes from God. There are a lot of lying preachers loose in the world. 
Here's how you test for the genuine spirit of God. Everyone who confesses openly his faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God who came as an actual flesh and blood person, comes from God and belongs to God. And everyone who refuses to confess faith in Jesus has nothing in common with God. This is the spirit of Antichrist that you heard was coming. Well, here it is, sooner than we thought. My dear children, you come from God and belong to God. You have already won a big victory over those false teachers, for the spirit in you is far stronger than anything in the world. These people belong to the Christ-denying world. They talk the world's language and the world eats it up. But we come from God and belong to God. Anyone who knows God understands us and listens. The person who has nothing to do with God will, of course, not listen to us. This is another test for telling the spirit of truth from the spirit of deception. God is love. My beloved friends, let us continue to love each other since love comes from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and experiences a relationship with God. The person who refuses to love doesn't know the first thing about God because God is love. So you can't know him if you don't love. This is how God showed his love for us. God sent his only son into the world so we might live through him. This is the kind of love we are talking about. Not that we once upon a time loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to clear away our sins and the damage they've done to our relationship with God. My dear, dear friends, if God loved us like this, we certainly ought to love each other. No one has seen God, ever. But if we love one another, God dwells deeply within us and his love becomes complete in us. Perfect love. This is how we know we're living steadily and deeply in Him and He in us. He's given us life from His life, from His very own Spirit. Also, we've seen for ourselves and continue to state openly that the Father sent His Son as Savior of the world. Everyone who confesses that Jesus is God's Son participates continuously in an intimate relationship with God. We know it so well, we've embraced it heart and soul, this love that comes from God. To love, to be loved. God is love. When we take up permanent residence in a life of love, we live in God and God lives in us. This way, love has the run of the house, becomes at home and mature in us, so that we're free of worry on Judgment Day. Our standing in the world is identical with Christ's. There's no room in love for fear. Well-formed love banishes fear, since fear is crippling, a fearful life, Fear of death, fear of judgment, is one not yet fully formed in love. We, though, are going to love, love and be loved. First we were loved, now we love. He loved us first. If anyone boasts, I love God, and goes right on hating his brother or sister, thinking nothing of him, he is a liar. If he won't love the person he can see, how can he love the God he can't see? The command we have from Christ is blunt. Loving God includes loving people. You've got to love both. Chapter 5 Every person who believes that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah, is God begotten. If we love the one who conceives the child, we'll surely love the child who was conceived. The reality test on whether or not we love God's children is this. Do we love God? Do we keep His commands? The proof that we love God comes when we keep His commandments, and they are not at all troublesome power that brings the world to its knees. Every God-begotten person conquers the world's ways. The conquering power that brings the world to its knees is our faith. The person who wins out over the world's ways is simply the one who believes Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus, the divine Christ. He experienced a life-giving birth and a death-killing death. Not only birth from the womb, but baptismal birth of his ministry and sacrificial death. And all the while, the Spirit is confirming the truth, the reality of God's presence at Jesus' baptism and crucifixion, bringing those occasions alive for us. A triple testimony, the Spirit, the baptism, the crucifixion, and the three in perfect agreement. If we take human testimony at face value, how much more should we be reassured when God gives testimony as he does here, testifying concerning his Son? Whoever believes in the Son of God inwardly confirms God's testimony. Whoever refuses to believe in effect calls God a liar, refusing to believe God's own testimony regarding His Son. This is the testimony in essence. God gave us eternal life. 
the life is in his son. So whoever has the son has life. Whoever rejects the son rejects life. The reality, not the illusion. My purpose in writing is simply this, that you who believe in God's son will know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you have eternal life, the reality, not the illusion. And how bold and free we then become in his presence, freely asking according to his will, sure that he's listening. And if we're confident that he's listening, we know that what we've asked for is as good as ours. For instance, if we see a Christian believer sinning, clearly I'm not talking about those who make a practice of sin in a way that is fatal, leading to eternal death. We ask for God's help and he gladly gives it, gives life to the sinner whose sin is not fatal. There is such a thing as a fatal sin, and I'm not urging you to pray about that. Everything we do wrong is sin, but not all sin is fatal. We know that none of the God begotten makes a practice of sin, fatal sin. The God begotten are also the God protected. The evil one can't lay a hand on them. We know that we are held firm by God. It's only the people of the world who continue in the grip of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God came so we could recognize and understand the truth of God. What a gift! And we are living in the truth itself, in God's Son, Jesus Christ. This Jesus is both true God and real life. Dear children, be on guard against all clever facsimile. 